that time electromechanically oriented and had wide support within IBM. The majority opinion was that the IBM future was best served in an electromechanical direction, not an electronic one. So we chose the name Defense Calculator to gain support within IBM and to take the political path of least resistance. Hmm. See, as long as it was called the Defense Calculator, everybody thought it was something very special. And the time was the Korean War. And Korean the War. Yeah. That's yeah. exactly right. But, but it wasn't Korean Now, I also thing. got to tell you that at the, the Nat mentioned before this Board of Directors meeting that was held at Poughkeepsie when we had essentially finished the, the model and got the model working. What we did was clean out the offices that were next to the model room, and there was a partition separating that resulting room from the model room that had glass windows like this. And we had arranged the chairs in that room so the board of directors could come in and sit down, and Nat and I and Ralph Palmer and so forth would make little speeches about the machine, and then we would allow them to go into the room and actually see the machine in operation. Like about 7 o'clock the night before this was going to happen, McDowell, who was the vice president of engineering, came to look the place over and said, you can't possibly have this arrangement. It's too distracting because you've got people in there working on the machine. You see, the machine wouldn't run for more than 15 minutes at a crack. And so we had all these guys in there keeping the machine tuned, you know, so we could run it. He says, you've got to have a curtain in front of those windows. And... It's got to match the curtains on the walls that you've got in the machine room. And at the right time, you'll open the curtains. So the people are then allowed to see the machine at the right moment. And we said, but Wally, <laughs> it's like 7 o'clock at night. And we know there's no more of that material left in Poughkeepsie. And even if we had the material, we don't know that we could you know, sew a drape that long. <laughs> you know, it was like 40 feet long. He said, you've got all night, don't you? And so we did it. <laughs> we sent people to New York. We got seamstresses out of bed, and the thing worked the next morning. And when the curtain was pulled, you could see ankles and, and heels disappearing behind <laughs> the boxes. <laughs> people were scurrying to get out of the way. <laughs> but at that meeting, another thing that happened just one day, one day prior to that meeting, I had written my speech, and it was all written out. And I had said defense calculator. I referred to it as defense calculator. And also that night, in addition to receiving this blow about the drape, I received the blow that said, we are not going to call it the defense calculator anymore. I said, well, that's fine. What are we going to call it? And they said, we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> And so I had to go back through my speech, and every time I had reference to the defense calculator, I had to cross it out and put this machine. <laughs> it had no name. Didn't we have EDPM? But, uh, yeah, we we, no, shipped, we, we shipped a number of the machines with no name. And finally, I received, Jerry had left the project, and I was in charge of the, the, the uh, enter into production and follow on. on the, and I received a call from New York saying, do you realize the machine has no name plate on it? Correct. Well, why is that? <laughs> because you guys couldn't make up your mind. <laughs> and so within hours, obviously, we had a name, and we were making nameplates like mad, and they were sent out. But it was just one of those little, it was unimportant, it seemed to us. But I thought it'd be interesting that you understood why it was called Defense Calculator, and called that right up to the time that it went out of the company. And then it was, then and only then was it named the, the yes, 701. 701. I, 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 too, had a, a, a run-in with that edict. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's that, right. Uh, Lord Astrahan and I had submitted a paper uh, that was published in the proceedings of the ACM the Pittsburgh meeting in 1952, uh, and uh, it, it was a, uh, the title was uh, the IBM Defense Calculator, <laughs> and uh, so it became the paper uh, the logical organization of the IBM Defense Calculator. So the paper is actually entitled "The Logical Organization of the New IBM Scientific Calculator." And uh, <laughs> I had to hurry, hurry and call the editor and get it all changed. And 
uh, and I got that done before before the proceedings went before the announcement went to press. And you'll notice it was not uh, a computer; it was still a calculator at that time. Yeah. yeah, and I mentioned before that we never used the word memory. We were restrained from we were restrained from giving names to pieces of the equipment that were human in nature. Things like memory, memories associated with people. Uh, I forgot. That came from von Neumann. But he deliberately did give. I understand, names. but but you know, they the Watsons especially, I think, uh, went to great lengths to get away from the notion that we were building equipment that was going to take, that was going to be human-like in nature. That was going to be able to think by itself. That was essentially going to replace the human part of human beings. You see, and and calling something a memory all kind of invested it with human qualities. Mm -hmm. At least was skirted on the edge of it. Yeah, well, it was more than that too, because uh, it was also the application of computers. Uh, we were strongly uh, enjoined from applying computers in roles that were suggestive of Brave New World. Uh, in other words, they with machi machines were never to control people. And so IBM always, always, always stood, uh, shied very clear of uh, circumstances in which a, uh, uh, an IBM machine would control people. Well, that, that uh, raises an interesting question. Uh, in one of the publications, there's a list of the very earliest projects that were done on the 701, and it included, for example, an election night uh, uh, activity Prediction, with George yeah. Gallup, and it included a checker playing machine, and... Um, well, the election night thing was not controlling people. That was predicting the election result, not telling people how to vote, let's say. Yeah. Um, and uh, of course, there was also the um, uh, the job shop programs. Those, those were among the earliest applications. Actually, I'd like to press this a little further. What uh, what were the some of the um, stimuli that led to the particular early applications that people programmed? Oh, the. Uh the, the the most well, so far as the seven hundred one is concerned, the uh, what we were concerned with was the uh, were the things that the customers wanted to do, and the things that the that as we we had to we had to support what the customers what the market required, and there were three parts to that. One uh, one was uh, in in the air 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 air, air, air frame industry. The, the, the vibrations of an airframe are a very severe problem. And if you wanted to sell an airplane, you had to submit to the government an analysis which proved that it wouldn't shake to pieces. And the techniques for doing this were uh, all by computation, and they were very difficult to do. And as airplanes got more complicated, it got worse and worse and worse. And so it was to solve that problem. Uh, uh, and then other things in the air aircraft industry, but that problem was the most important one. Uh, to design a design a, an, air, an airplane that wouldn't fall apart, and also to meet the government requirement. Uh, and then the, that's one. So that's one third. Another third was in the um, uh, atomic bomb business. It's nice to know what's going to happen if you set off an atomic bomb before you actually do it, and uh, that involved a huge amount of computation. <laughs> And the third, the third piece of part, part of support was in code breaking. Uh, it takes a huge amount of computation to take uh, 50 words of, of cipher text uh, when you don't know what the cipher is and break down the break it down and discover discover how they coded it and uh, uh, have a, and, and, and have a machine so you can take coded messages and run run them in at full speed and run out clear text. Uh, and and so that was the that was the third thing. Uh, now that's that's for the seven hundred one. That's what the seven hundred one was was designed to do. 
uh, those three problems. Are those they, three problems roughly on the same scale? Would it, would they, uh, or would, could you rank order them in terms of the magnitude of the demand? Well, I think we sold most. I, I don't know. You you probably know better than I. Air uh, the, the uh, air, air, we sold most well, of the air, aircraft, aircraft industry. I think in Los Alamos. Uh, it has a group, I think, uh, aircraft. A bunch of aircraft. And the Weather Bureau was the 19th machine, by the way, and I was yeah. only supposed to build 18. That's another story if you <laughs> want to hear that. The Weather Bureau was the 19th, uh, mostly aircraft. That, that, that was the biggest. Los Alamos, and I'm not sure whether the Livermore got energy. one. Did Livermore get one? And NSA third. One well, NSA was code breaking, uh, code breaking third. Yeah. Uh, well, well, third so, only, be, only because... Uh, they didn't need that many. I mean, you know, they bought. Yeah. They, they they needed it worse than anybody else. Now they they were they were a tremendous stimulus to the to the technology. I mean, they, uh, for example, uh, before I'd heard of a computer, I knew a whole lot about uh, about the circuit techniques that we used in computers What's as a result that? of uh, filling contracts uh, for for NSA. Yeah, uh, and they and they, they 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 would come in and they would give you lectures that would. Give you just the information you needed to solve the, to build the machine that they wanted you to bid on, and uh, and then you'd bid on it. But then you you can imagine beyond that what nifty things could be done. And, <laughs> they must have uh, had an extensive research program. What? They must have had an extensive research program to guide you that way. No. Or are they getting it from other sources like ERA? No, we. Uh, you mean? No, yeah, say. Yeah, they. No, we no we NSA no we we, we never knew how to break codes. No, I'm talking about the electronics. Electronics. That is, they In order to specify, they must have known electronics. Oh, yes, they knew electronics. Yes. He said they must have had a large... Oh, they did, yes, yes. Uh, I'm sorry. I resource of their own. Um, yeah, they, they, they did. Well, mainly, mainly they had a lot of... They had people that would go out and buy things, and so the, their, their laboratory consisted of the laboratories of their, of their suppliers, who were the best people they could find. Uh, and they... They, they they performed an enormous service to computers, and apparently the same thing happened in England. Uh, but that's that's where uh, Turing was working, and so uh, we we have a great debt to the to, to this. Well, part I do know where one went. Oddly enough, Doctor Gross was working for GE yeah, yeah. in Kentucky in the appliance division, and we sent one down there. He came it's up and spent two weeks with me before it tipped. Yeah. Yeah. So that was a what application would that be? It's it's <laughs> perhaps. <laughs> Well, number one, it should be fairly easy to get a list of who those first no, customers were. Oh, that, that list yeah, exists, yes. Uh, number, number two, it, it's perhaps easier to talk about the constraints yep. All right. than it is the to approach the problem the other way. The At the time the 701 yep. came out, that has made the point that there existed only a relative handful of organizations in the country that had the mathematical talent to be able to use these machines. Yeah. Yeah. And people in commerce and industry, other than the engineering people, especially those working for the aircraft industry, didn't have any clear notion of how to use electronics to further their commercial or industrial efforts. About the time we shipped the 701, the UNIVAC was delivered, first UNIVAC was delivered to Appliance Park, GE Appliance Park. That's mm -hmm. got mixed up. And that was a very bad experience because neither the customer nor the UNIVAC people knew how to get the thing running in a in an effective way as far as that as far as GE was concerned. Mm -hmm. And it succeeded in a, in a way it benefited us because observing this we knew damn well that we had better never install a machine unless we were absolutely certain that the customer knew how to use it and what to use it for. Yes. Okay? Now after the 701, when we began delivery of the 702s and then the 705s to commercial and industrial customers, I can recall sitting in Monday morning hell sessions in Thomas J. Watson Jr.'s corner office 
where people like Hurd and Learson and all the big guns of the company were called to task, all right, what machines are we going to ship this week? Who are they going to? You know, sign in blood that that customer is ready to get the, the air conditioning is in, the floors are in, the, the programs are written, the customer knows that the programs work, we've given him time on other machines and things of that nature. And it was only through top level, absolutely top level on down pressure that our sales and marketing and installation and service crews, based on this very negative experience at Appliance Park, went in and said, made damn sure that every machine we installed did what the customer expected it to do. Now, another negative in those days was the fact that most, if not all, programming done was done in machine language or at best assembly language, you know, a little late, later. Very, very tedious <laughs> way to do programming. And I can still recall the arguments that raged within IBM with regard to the 650 even, about whether Fortran was ever going to be a practical way, a mechanistic way, you see, to program a computer, a, a, a human being would always be able to get a better program because he would know more tricks. Okay. And in those days, memories were very small compared to what they are today. And so these programs had to be very efficient. And today, you, you know, my God, in this little personal computer that everybody's got at home, You've got more memory capacity by orders of magnitude than we had on those early machines. <laughs> 20K of electrostatic, and I've got 256K of uh, RAM and little box. Okay. So <laughs> these were the negatives. That Number one, the customers didn't have a good appreciation. It was almost as though you had taken a racing car to deepest, darkest Africa or to the far, furthest reaches of Eskimo land and said to an Eskimo, here, take this beautiful new racing car. And enjoy it. And he would and enjoy it. And he would look at you and say, what the hell am I going to do with it? All right? And it was kind of that situation with regard to computers and people in commerce and industry. Well, and it, was, it was an inch at a time. It was more than that. After, after computers began to take hold, then, then somebody running a company would feel that he had to have a computer. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and so IBM installed a... Uh, a principle uh, for the salesman that you get a certain commission when you sell a computer, sure. and if it goes off rental within a year, IBM takes it back, oh. <laughs> and, and, uh, or takes most of it back. Mm -hmm. and, IBM uh, really knows how to motivate. <laughs> <laughs> the idea is that, that IBM felt that it had a real responsibility not to allow a customer to uh, get himself in trouble. Uh, yes. I mean, if he demanded a computer. Well, the salesman wouldn't sell it to him if the salesman knew he was going to get in trouble. And <laughs> and and only only you have to depend upon the salesman because he's the only person who knows that company. Yeah. Most selling, by the way, even today, is done on the basis of reference selling. Mm -hmm. You take this customer and you show him what that customer is doing, and he says, "Yes, that's what I want to do." Mm -hmm. And that means that there has to be somebody doing it to begin with, right? Yes. Well, there are only very few customers willing to, to, to ride point, mm -hmm. willing to be the vanguard. Mm -hmm. Okay? There are only certain Willing or able. Yeah, or able. Yeah. yeah. And so that's why in the days of, of, of the mid-1950s to the, let's say, early 1960s, the, the applications were much easier to conceive of by technical people yes. than by the customers. Yes. There, there were not the reference points that you could use to, you know, existence theorem. Here's a machine <coughs> doing this. Why don't you buy one? And there weren't the programming. Age. Programming was an expensive, tedious, you know, time-consuming operation. And those are the negatives that, that you could not overcome with any one fell swoop. I mean, they were the kind of thing, it would come back to the market had to be developed.
just like the market for automobiles had to be developed. You, you, you know, if, if somebody had come to this country and said, I will give you a million automobiles next year, in the year 1903, would the country have been able to accept them? Sorry. No gas stations, no roads, no touring maps, no, yes. no mechanics, no garages. Yes. Okay. That infrastructure had to be built up. Yeah. And that's what I'm talking about when I say develop a market. You had right. to develop a desire, you had to develop an infrastructure. And that just simply didn't exist in the early mid 19 you No, know, I often talk about how we also developed the air conditioning market. Yes. Back <laughs> in the uh, 604 days, I had to make a lot of field trips, you know, with machines that wouldn't run in the summertime, get in these offices, and they'd kick out at a certain temperature. We had thermostats on and I'd walk out saying, you've got to air uh, cool this room. Well, then the guy would air condition his room there, and then uh, the operators would work in a nice, cool environment, Then the office people would want the <laughs> cool environment, <laughs> and then the factory. So I think we advanced it probably 10 years, you know. Uh -huh. And I guess, well, the uh, 701, we said they had to air condition, had oh, to have a control environment. Yeah, the 604, no we, we just sent them out there, and when it got hot, they wouldn't run. Yeah. And we had to cool them. I would like to object to something you said, Jerry. Uh, and that is the programming is tedious. It was. Uh, it things. was. The only part uh, of programming te being tedious is for the manager waiting for the programmer to get his work done. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, what the programmer, the programmer, it's fun, it's fun to program. Yeah, it may be fun, but you know, uh, my point was in machine level language or in assembly uh, language, it, it, it is, if not tedious, then paints that just takes you forever. Yes. You know. It's, but it's fun. It's, it's, well, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's job security. <laughs> job security is right. <laughs> but today, the programs that are available today, <coughs> as evidenced by how people are using these little personal computers, uh, is just unbelievable by comparison with the, oh, with yes. the painstaking work that had to be done back in those days. Yeah. I can still recall one IBM customer, I don't know who it was, you maybe remember, came in after programming. A sample problem that Nat had given him to program or something like that. And he put it on the 701 and it worked. And we told that guy, you better go into the negligee business or something like that because you will never, ever again in your whole life duplicate <laughs> that experience. <laughs> uh, I'd like to bring up uh, the, uh, something that, that's very close to that. And that's the time when we brought. Uh, uh, Customers for the 701s into that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean that, this, that this, was this that occurred time, yeah. during that time. Uh, what we did uh, this was August uh, 1952. We brought we brought in two typically two representatives from each customer to Poughkeepsie for a week. Let's see, uh, 24th through 29th. That's a week. Uh, and. Uh, First of all, uh, and, and they were they were they, they they we met right in the building where we were where we where we had the engineering model of the 701, uh, uh, and we were, we were still working on the design of it, but we had it running. Mm -hmm. uh, at least it ran some of the time, mm -hmm. and uh, so we uh, gave them lectures, uh, and uh, we uh, taught them to program, and we provided them with this book, uh, uh, which contains descriptions of. Uh, of, the, of programs we, we had written that, that, that they could use. This is software in its most rudimentary form. Utility programs. You Utility programs. Yeah. And uh, some, some examples of mathematical programs, uh, uh, a, a, a lot of different things, including, uh, including a, 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 a symbolic assembler, which uh, I, I was involved with, and another assembler that they developed, de developed in the, they called it an assembler, but it isn't what's called an assembler now. Uh, and uh, the... Uh, uh, so then, then each 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 customer, uh, the two representatives from each customer, and one IBM person formed a team, and this team uh, uh, then developed a program, which uh, then after uh, after the after the uh, later like Thursday or something like that, each customer uh, got an opportunity to use the computer for twenty minutes or half an hour or something like that. Uh, and then, uh, and then a little, a little later, maybe Friday, they'd get another crack at the computer for a little while. And so this this enabled the customers to see to see firsthand what they were about to receive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I remember during one of those customer debug sessions, he came in 
he had his cards, put in the card reader. He had a printout of all the cards, and on fan fold paper, it must have been an inch thick. And he pushed the start button, and instantly the stoplight came on. So he started a single cycle through program step one, <laughs> two. I said, why don't we look at the program counter? It's so 2,000 and something. He said, it can't be. I just took my finger off. This <laughs> 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 is always instantaneous. <laughs> It was, it, was, it was just an amazing experience. That happened to me. The first program I put on the 701, yeah. that's, uh, uh, it had happened. I mean, I pushed the button and <laughs> it was all over. <laughs> it's all done. <laughs> well, the biggest yeah. complaint I got from the executives was that there's nothing to see. The only things that had any animation to them, any motion, if you will, were the card input output and the printer. The drums revolved. Well, you can't see a drum revolve. You can hear it, but you can't see it. The yeah. tapes went up and down, you know, and spun a little yeah, bit. The neon lights were blinking so rapidly, it was a steady glow. It was just <laughs> a steady glow. Yeah. And, yeah. and when you'd push this button and you'd say, oh, the computer is now working. I'd say, how do you know? <laughs> But you know, our customers for years brought their, or our salesmen brought the customers and watched sorters run and they were exciting. And, but I remember they'd come in on the seven, on one floor and everything was quiet, come lights blinking, and uh, what's going on? <laughs> There's the memory, there's a bunch of pretty dots on a tube, but uh, no excitement. Yeah. I like to come back to something we were talking about before. This was, um, you described the three industries that were ready represented the initial market. But uh, in Cuthbert... It would be Perth, three or four, maybe. Three or four, yeah. yeah. Well, in any case, in Cuthbert Hurt's article here that I, that I was quoting, he lists a lot of the initial application programs that were written, now, that were not of this kind, that were obviously written either internally or by some scholar somewhere with a special problem and so on. He lists... Translation of Russian into English in cooperation with Georgetown University. Demonstration of Euclidean plane geometry, which... Uh, when did that did. happen? One of these things. <clears throat> well, he, he says, um, the following innovations and applications programming are noteworthy, all done during the period 54-55. Sure, but that was quite a, a bit later. later. Mm -hmm. You see, a yeah, year was right. just an eternity in those days. Okay. And Nat and I are talking in terms of 1952-53, when we first began to ship that machine. Yes. A year later, those people had an infinite amount of experience by comparison. Yes. Okay. Now, all of a sudden, there were 18 sets of people developing programs, learning the lore. Yes. There were, you know, many times 18 people being reference sold. Yes. Because at that point, we had made up our minds to do the 702 and then the 705. Yes. And we would bring potential 702, 705 customers to the 701 that were already operating. Yes. See? So a year was really an eternity. 18 months okay. after December 52, we had shipped all of the 701. You know, a year, ago when, I, a year ago when I got my IBM PC, there yeah. was just DOS and VisiCal, right. Easy Writer, and now there's an ending list. That's right. All in one year. Yes. Also, yes. if you if you if you went to a uh, one of the you know, one of the things I didn't, haven't mentioned is a share an organization. Yes, yes, uh, very important. Uh, very important. Uh, this uh, uh, share evolved out of this customer class that's that for which we distributed this book. I mean, these people all got to know each other, and they said, "Well, let's get together and share programs." Yes, and they called the organization Share. Uh, but if you, if you went to a share meeting uh, in the, in those early years. And you find found out who had something to offer, uh, who was describing something interesting. Well, the papers were uh, probably half of the good papers were by the by the aircraft industry, and uh, then the, then the, then there was a smaller. Of course, this partly has to do with security that the NSA people didn't come in and describe how they <laughs> broke the latest Russian code. <laughs> now Georgetown University. <laughs> Q. Uh, Q. Uh, Q, Q, Q clearance was required to find out what they were really doing in Los Alamos. And so what they would do is talk about the weather and think about blowing up a bomb uh, because the equations are relatively really, uh, they're related. The techniques put mm -hmm. together. Yes. But, uh, all right, so, so part of the answer is, I'm, I'm skipping ahead, but of this kind of activity that was 
much more diverse and widespread. How much of it was internally generated? Were you at IBM, uh, well, this uh, Euclidean plane geometry thing, which uh, you did with Galanter, presumably, was partly internal. Uh, we had we had we had some people like Art Samuel. Yes, uh, was interested in in kind of chess and checkers. Yes, other people were interested in language translation. A great many of these efforts came to naught on yeah. on these relatively small, by today's standards, relatively slow by today's standards, relatively unsupported by today's standards of genes. Language translation, for example, is only now beginning to be a practical thing yeah. in terms of... In terms of you had a Russian translator in the World's Fair. Yeah, but yeah. it wasn't... You know, it was but there, there were people in our individuals. It was not... It was not... Was it organized? Not really. As a matter of fact, quite the contrary. The, the big problem that the management had was to make damn sure that everybody didn't go around playing in little sand piles. Okay? And <laughs> like games on today's well, uh, like Euclidean geometry. Very interesting, intellectually satisfying perhaps, but how many machines is it gonna sell? Yeah. Okay? And you know, we were busy building an industry. We were busy building a business. Yeah. So the, the, the number of people that we would be willing to support spending even part time on stuff like that was relatively small. There were yeah. you know, a couple this, dozen maybe. But. Yeah, this, this paper uh, uh, on Euclidean geometry had its origin in the following uh, a sequence of events. Uh, artificial intelligence is generally believed to have begun in Dartmouth mm -hmm. uh, in the summer of, was it 58 or 59? One or the other. Well, that's one, one story. Uh, yeah. the other people believe it, 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 it began at Carnegie Tech. Well, McCarthy will say it began a lot earlier when he started thinking about artificial intelligence. Yeah, but, but any, anyway, yeah. Uh, this, uh, this, this Dartmouth study yes. was, uh, uh, I think it was McCar uh, Shannon and I and McCarthy signed the proposal to the whatever branch of the government that supported it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, or was it Minsky? I've forgotten whether it was Minsky or McCarthy. And so, McCarthy has told the other side of the story, so please tell it. <coughs> okay. Well, anyway, uh, I, 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 I spent part of the time that summer up there in the study. Uh, there were three of us that signed the uh, uh, proposal to the government, and, and it, was, it was Shannon. We figured we had to get Shannon, and he was more status than any of the rest of us do. And, and he was willing to do it and interested. And, and I, and either McCarthy or Minsky. Does it, McCarthy it was? Yeah, yeah I think that's right. Okay, then, yeah. and, and McCarthy had been very interested in this ahead of time. Sure. Uh, and uh, one of the things that uh, came up was some work by somebody, and I think it was, I think it was Minsky on, on theorem proving. Or I guess we were all talking about theorem. It was McCarthy. Or was that Simon and Newell? And Simon and Newell, so they were inter interested too. Yeah. And so, uh, I came back from that study, and I had this fellow Galander just come to work for me, and uh, 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 he he carried this out under my direction. And we actually proved theorem. We actually developed a system that would prove theorems in Euclidean geometry. I mean, this is an activity that you know went out out of the range of things computers you think of computers ordinarily doing. And, and I, I at that time I had I had uh, left. The development activity. Uh, see, I was after the after the after the seven oh one came the. Uh, I, I eventually was put in charge of all of EDPM engineering. That was about the time you went to Endicott to be put in charge of the laboratory, yep. and uh, and and so uh, I, I was managing the all, all of these machines, uh, all the seven hundred series engineering the seven hundred series machines. And then, along about 1956, was it, when research was started? I'd have to look this yeah, up. Yeah, 56. Uh, 56. Why? <clears throat> I, 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 I uh, left my position there, and people said, you're out of your head, Rochester, and uh, uh, went into research. His, so, his favorite line was, I merely 
strive to be a humble scientist. I'll never forget that. <laughs> well, and anyway, uh, so uh, I went off in this direction, and I was trying to ex I was trying to explore different interesting things, and mm -hmm. uh, one of them was artificial intelligence, and. I find it, I find it, after doing this, I finally decided that was a hard way to earn a living. That uh, the results weren't going to come as fast in artificial intelligence as they were in some other fields. Mm -hmm. and so I, I didn't do too much in that after that. But, mm -hmm. but I think, and, and Samuel was very interested in a related thing. His checker program uh, eventually be, became a, a top rate rank uh, checker player. Uh, and he never did, he himself. And he, he was very careful not to become an expert checker player. Uh, he wanted his, and his, his machine was able to learn. This was part of what he was doing. Yeah. And, uh, and, and there were many things like this, where we were reaching around, groping, trying to, find, trying to find the ranges of things that computers could do. I mean, this is important to do, to, to look, look around. Uh, but it's also, also you don't put, put a lot of money in these things uh, unless, unless there's market. Yes. Uh, and there was no special organization... Well, later on, IBM set up a uh, system of IBM fellows and so on. But at, that, at this stage, there was no special organization by which some specific people were yes. set aside. To, oh, there was. But not on such projects as this, which, uh -huh. are, which are more scholarly in nature. And so on. In the uh, late 50s, there was set up under a joint operation at that point, we had a product planning department under Jim Birkenstock and the engineering department under Wally McDowell. We took a group of people that worked for Birkenstock, headed by a guy by the name of Mike Cammy, and, uh, goodness, and a group of people working for, in the engineering organization, uh, under John Coons, and we we called them, we combined them under their mutual heads, cooperative heads, and we called them the Advanced Planning Group. And their job was to to investigate how the electronic data processing business was going to go, how we should push it. And they very quickly came down on a couple of principles. They're very pedestrian as compared with checker playing and chess and artificial intelligence and all that. But they concluded rather quickly that the uh, that integrated data processing was going to be the order of the day. What do we mean by integrated data processing? Up until that time, the payroll department had its punch card machines. The sales department had its punch card machines. The factory had its punch card machines. And each of these departments did the applications like payroll, accounts receivable, accounts payable, inventory, etc., with their own punch card machines. Integrated data processing meant that rather than all these departments do their individual applications, each on its own set of machines, they would all flow into and be done by a single set of machines on an integrated basis. And the reason was that the machines were getting very big, and the bigger the machines, the less unit cost there was. To Grocious law. Or Grocious law. It was still very much in evidence. That was item number one. Item number two that they quickly came on was that there was going to be a great, a great flow toward what you would call transaction processing. And again, if you, if you examine where we stood or where commercial industrial applications stood at that time, punch card machines and such electronic computers as existed up until this time, were used to do historical record-keeping kind of things. The transaction would take place, and sometime later, the equipment would, would catch up and help in the accounting, if you will, of those transactions. What they showed 
on the other hand, was that it was going to be possible to enter transactions directly into the data processing system and have them affect all affected files within a day, let's say. This was prior to when you would think in terms of communication links and terminals, which took it still another step, don't you see? Yes. And they, having come to this conclusion, conceptual conclusion, they did a study, they picked a company, and it happened to be Arrow, Hart, and Hageman. Uh, I've forgotten where they are, Hartford or someplace like that. <laughs> But it was a it was a good sized company without being a giant company. It was no GE or General Motors. Yes. But it was a you know the, I, I guess Arrowhart and Hegeman deal in electrical switches, switches and things of that That's nature. Sure. And and they have you know a fairly good sized product line, but it's not enormous and, and so on certain number of employees, and they took that company and they analyzed its data processing operations, all of them. Not just the stuff that was on punch card equipment or computers. They analyzed all of the record keeping and information flow in that company. Mm -hmm. And they took an awful lot of data and then they sat down and did an awful lot of conjecture as to how they would structure the information processing in that company. That work formed the basis of system development in the IBM company from that point forward. Mm -hmm. That work should, by the way, my cami is still alive and still very active. John Coombs, unfortunately, passed away some mm -hmm. years ago. My cami lives down in Lighthouse Point in Florida, and he's still mm -hmm. very, very active as a planning consultant, corporate planning consultant. How do you spell it? K A M I, oh. and Birkenstock would certainly know about this. Yes. We're going to be talking Birkenstock. Okay. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, and I would guess that you should be able, through Cami and or Birkenstock, to get a line on some of the people, and perhaps even some of the records that yeah. were involved in this Arrowheart and Hageman study. And so on. But this was a very concerted effort on IBM's part to divine the future. Now, to reach conclusions on principles of this kind is a. Uh, but I got to warn you, this was after the 701. Yeah, I, I understand. We, we are uh, running on. Uh, that, that, that's all right. I mean, this is all the what the 701 did. This okay. is how, how the 701 brought. Yeah, it, it heralded the entry into oh, this age. Just a, right. just a blip. <laughs> well, not more than the blip. And time. Uh -huh. Uh, but to reach conclusions of this kind, in a study of this kind, you go through a long and arduous process of debate and so on. You've told me the outcome. There must have been differences. There must have been issues. I, I'm sure there were. See, I was not involved in that work at a detailed level. Uh, at that point, I had, you know, life in IBM, unless you unless you chose to be a humble scientist, was, you know, holding tight to the rocket, as you did. Yeah. And, you know, by the, late, by, the, by the late 1950s, I was general manager of a division and so forth and so on. So I really didn't have a greatly intimate knowledge of what they were doing, and I'm really the wrong guy to discuss this with okay. in, any, in any detail. Well, let, let, let's carry that same question, though, then back to the period to, to where you were where four of you were directly concerned. Uh, you've told us certain conclusions you reached. You told us about the differences with the uh, 600 series card punch people. But were there some issues uh, within the group that uh, shared the perspective of, of the electronic computer uh, and which... Uh, not everyone agreed. What were the outcomes that you described, the, the choices that you made about uh, serial and parallel processing, about word length, about uh, uh, type of memory stored, or were about uh, uh, relationship of uh, hardware to software, uh, minimal hardware, and, and uh, a lot of microprogramming. So, were these issues okay. on which you arrived at a pretty good consensus, or were there some Okay. Sharp differences. Let, they, they, there began to develop sharp differences 
in the late 50s, early 60s. Mm -hmm. uh, and these sharp differences were the result of IBM following the strategy of developing a machine like the 701, then improving it into the 704, <coughs> and improving that into the 709, and improving that into the 7090. The 701, 704, 709, 7090 are all essentially the same basic machine, each one an elaboration of the previous one with better technology. For example, the 7090 was built with transistors. In all other respects, it was identical to the 709. Yeah. Okay. We had done the same thing on the commercial end. We had built the 702 and then the 705. And then the 7080, the 7080 being a transistorized version of the 705. We had built the 650 with tubes and <clears throat> magnetic drums. And then we jumped to something called a 7070, which was quite different. About that time, we came along with a 1401. Yeah. Okay. Now, the 1401, in turn, gave birth to the 1410. All of these machines were different in certain essential respects from all the others. About the same time, we had built the RAMAC, yes. the 305 RAMAC, out in San Jose. Now, that's quite a stable of machines. That is. Okay? All different. All different. Yes. That's important. Yes. All different. Yes. All requiring their own support. Yes. Yes. The 650, while it was conceived of originally as a scientific calculator, became the rage as a commercial machine. Yeah. The 1401 capitalized on that, and the 1401 became a kind of a workhorse. Yes. It just sold every place you could put it. I mean, it opened up markets just like the personal computers are today. Yeah. Now, the, the, the differences that got opened up as a result of all this, this big stable of equipment that got developed in response to this market or that market or this was, this is crazy, we're going to drive ourselves nuts, we ought to, you know, we ought to redo the product line. Mm -hmm. Now, the question came, how to redo the product line? There were many of us who felt that we could combine scientific and commercial into one set of machines, for instance, that we prevailed, and the 360 is the result, all right? Practically up to the announcement date of the 360, there was a well-respected and very capable contingent within the IBM company that felt it was an extremely bad mistake, and that what we should have done was continue to make binary processors, at least, in addition, they didn't care that we did the 360, but make binary processors in addition, growing them from 36 bits to 48 bits, which is what the competition is doing with that. Okay? So what you find in, in that period is that the market had opened up and had developed kind of willy-nilly to the point where we had a competing product line, overly specialized with respect to customers, taking enormous resources to support in terms of programming and service. And the split, the, the arguments, the, the uh, debates, etc., all centered around how do you get out of this mess and to what degree do you get out of it. Mm -hmm. The programming was mushroomy, as I recall. Each family's programming, programming were, were expanding. Yeah. You just weren't enough program. Yeah. You couldn't fix and enhance the things that were there and the customers were demanding. And and there and you couldn't bring them all together and under a higher order language, that sort of thing. No. I ought to tell you that in addition to that advanced planning operation, yeah. I was asked to set up originally in nineteen fifty six a, a, a division called the Special Engineering Products Division. My job was to supply customers with special equipment to order mm -hmm. as they required it. It very soon became obvious that really what we should be doing is developing advanced systems. 
And so we cha- in 1958, I believe, we changed the name of the division and grew it in a different direction, and we called it the Advanced Systems Development Division. Mm-hmm. And that division worked on application areas such as information storage and retrieval, airline reservations, railroad, freight car, inventory, and so forth. You know, a lot of real-time systems. They were all real-time systems. Yeah. Uh, We did work on chemical process control. Mm -hmm. Uh, Matter of fact, Cuthbert Hurd was in charge of that, uh, that aspect of it for a while, the chemical process control. Oh, indeed, in, the, in that family of machines you mentioned before, you, you, you didn't even get onto the process control machines. That we did not have any. You, you see, the Advanced Systems time. Development Division oh, is see. the one that started it, and, started and the it. process control machines that, that grew mm-hmm. up in the early 60s were the result of that early work of the Advanced Systems Development Division. The 1800s. Yeah. In San Jose. Yeah. Okay. But that was a day when you could conceive of all sorts of, of, of exotic applications of, yes. of, of digital equipment. <coughs> and, and what we did, what the Advanced Systems Development Division did, was usually to find a customer, potential customer, and work with the customer. Oh, we worked on medical systems, yeah. hospital systems. Yeah. Uh, at one point, ASDD had uh, maybe 20 doctors, medical doctors, working for it. Really? Really. We did special work in, in image storage and retrieval for the uh, for the CIA, mm-hmm. uh, et cetera. Now, that came about as a result of the management of the company appreciating the significance of the Arrowheart and Hegeman study and the advanced planning work that had gone on to the degree that the way one guy like Al Williams used to articulate it he used to say, you know, up until now, we we have machines not in a room. <laughs> and now we're going to have machines in a room, along with machines not in a room. And that was a very <laughs> crazy way. To, 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 what he was saying, really, was <coughs> that he foresaw that you would have large <coughs> networks of information processing over communication lines with machines that are central, you know, doing the uh, control and so on. Yes. And all of these, a lot of these applications were of that nature, that nature. Yes. So this was a period when you could let your imagination run wild and you, you know, like credit card systems were developed by mm-hmm. that organization and so on. Yeah. Uh, the, that was a period when the ability of people to conjecture applications and to realize those outstripped the customer's ability to to digest them. Yeah. Nobody, very few people want to be first. Uh, it, 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 it takes a brave, brave set of souls. Like you know, for C. R. Smith and American Airlines to spend the money he did. On a reserva- on an alphanumeric reservation system with twelve hundred agent sets and a large building in Briarcliff Manor to house the computers with a standby computer and a diesel generator and so forth and so on. That took all <coughs> sorts of business courage. It took him every bit as much business courage as it took Tom Watson Junior to want to do the seven oh one in the first place. Yeah. See the big difference between Tom Watson Nat mentioned it in the movie. And other business executives of the day was that Watson wanted to do more than build machines to order one at a time. He could see the thing coming. And he he had enough business courage so that he put a lot of money into this electronic area. Matter of fact, if you look over the IBM records, you'll see that I believe it was 1953, or one year the financial results were terrible. And that was was largely because he was socking that money in. That was when they, they, that picture of the uh, horses in a circle. (laughs) I've still got that. (laughs) You got that. (laughs) You know, as you would expect, Jerry mentioned when the uh, 
the, the master design, you might call it, for the 360 to get out of this multiplicity of competing systems. When that decision was made, he mentioned there was one group that was dissension where they wanted a 48-bit machine. These other groups didn't go down very easily either. Yes. They're, they're probably the strongest and most vocal. Uh, I was the president of GPD at that time in 1964, and the 1400 series, that oh, family, yeah. John Hamster was a very competent, capable a man, he had been my predecessor and had been fostering a, I don't know what they called it, but it was something beyond the 1460. It was a 1401. It was a 1460. It was, it was 1460. a 14, successor to the 1410. They claimed it was much, yes. much, much better, of course, than the 360 Mod 30, which was assigned to yes. my division at that oh, time. I see. I so see. I just wanted you to know that, you know, you make a decision, you still have to work to convince and to get everyone marching down the same path. Yes. Which is really not easy in a big corporation. The yeah. diabolical scheme that Mr. Learson and Mr. Yeah. Spaulding used to break that impasse was to pick a task force, which they called the Spread, spread. Task Force. Yeah. Yeah. And the guy they picked to run it <laughs> was Hanstra. The number one dissenter. The number one dissenter. You make him come up with an answer that he doesn't like. <laughs> uh, <laughs> because it's the right answer for the company. Uh, and thank God our people are capable of doing that. Yeah. If you, put them on the hot seat, if you put them on the hot seat, they'll, they will set their own personal feelings aside. Yes. But yes. if he had been a lieutenant of that task force, he would have made the chairman's life miserable. Fair and he might yes. have even won. Yes. <laughs> the uh, set of machines that, and the time relationship among them that yes. Jerry, Jerry described is, is shown graphically uh, in this. This is the uh, anniversary issue of the IBM Journal. Oh, I think you have this. Yes. Uh, but you see, this, this diagram shows all of the machines that he mentioned. Yep. And the time scale. Yeah. And it shows them ending up in the System 360 at the end. Right. So yep. that's an, uh, you'll find this useful in, in understanding the your notes. Yeah. And, and, and when the did the word computer get to be accepted? Jerry, do you recall? When did computer become an accepted word? Computer versus calculator. I don't recall. I really don't know. I think it, it was one of these things that happened gradually. Yeah, as that word memory. changed it. I mean, you know, the, hell, he was trying to, you know, we were trying to push water uphill to, try to pre <laughs> yeah. prevent our, our, our engineers from, from uh, uh, calling flip-flops uh, trigger circuits or trigger circuits flip-flops. Remember mother and sister boards? Yeah. Kind of, well, well, still in. Mother and still sister boards, was that taboo? Hmm? Mother and I, don't recall I that heard taboo. it was, and I was... Uh, uh, oh, we called them mother boards. Mother <laughs> boards? <laughs> what was the other sister boards? Board? I don't know. Um, are you suggesting a break? Suggesting either a break or maybe we just break the dinner. Well, maybe I have at least one other question. Uh, uh, maybe there are other things you want to discuss. Do you want to take a break now, or do you, or or should we just go a little longer and then break and uh, give you a, an hour? To, I might dinner? mention dinner. I have to be in Poughkeepsie tomorrow with my mother and an attorney. So Can you get there. Be able to get there. Pardon? Can you get there. Oh yeah. Oh, I I, <laughs> I drove over from Albany, so I can find my way back. And unfortunately, I, I, you're very kind in your invitation, but I've got to be in Baltimore tonight, so... Okay. Uh, well, those of you who are free, or, or go on. Uh, well, do you... Well, I want to learn what your plans were. Oh, well, I, I would be very happy. I've accepted your invitation. I'll be very happy to come, but if, it, if the dinner party... Uh, Dissolves into, into nothing, why? Then I, I will not. We'd be very that. happy to make other arrangements. Yeah. No, 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 no yeah. that's fine. I, 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 what did you, are you uh, free? I am available. Oh, I'm well, free, that's fine. But, uh, be, yeah, there are a couple of us, and uh, a, couple, a couple of us, and we'll have a very pleasant. Uh, I'm, I'm awfully sorry to miss it. I'm sure I'd enjoy it. Well, actually, I, I have a. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go, no, go ahead. Well, I, I, I have one comment. Uh, Please. That, uh, that, 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 that is in response to your question. But why don't you, uh, that, that I can bring up whenever the time comes, but it doesn't have to be now, and I won't forget. So, you, what, what well, you I think I think as far as my, I, I have one other question I want to put to you, but uh, and you may have some things that you've just been waiting for the right moment to come up and so on. But I think we're probably uh, running down a bit, and you're probably ready for uh, uh, just to break fairly soon. So, what my suggestion would be to go right ahead. Uh, and then uh, in 20 minutes or whatever it ends up being, uh, stop and, and uh, call it the afternoon, and then we'll meet again later on. Uh, so go ahead. Well, you were saying what, what uh, debates or disagreements occurred. Yes. And um, <coughs> now, at that time, memory was very expensive. 
Yep. And not and not very reliable. And, uh, <laughs> Shame on you. I mean, it was a it was a it was it was a real problem. It, it's it was the major. It was the major. It was the major challenge, and the, and the way we succeeded with it was one of the reasons that the seven one was successful. But it was a, it was a real problem. And so now the, now the question is, how big should memory be? And uh, we had von Neumann as a consultant, and uh, and one of the things that uh, he always said is. You'll never need more than a thousand words. A computer will never need more than a thousand words of memory. 